This is the third video in a series devoted to an introductory course of proof writing. And previously we looked at the very basics of set, and now we're gonna look at mathematical statements, mathematical open sentences, as well as a bit of logic. Okay, so let's look at a definition first. So a mathematical statement, or sometimes just a statement, is a sentence that is either definitely true or definitely false. And this can be a sentence written in English, or it can be a sentence written in mathematical notation. So let's look at some examples. So for this first one, it says, if a square has a side length of x, it has an area of x. So that's a true statement, just by the standard area formula for a square. Next up, we have every odd integer is one more than an even integer. That's also a true statement, just by the simple characterization of even and odd integers. So next up, we've got three that are written in mathematical notation, but we can read these as complete sentences. We have 3030 is a natural number. In other words, 3030 is an element of the natural numbers. We have the natural numbers form a subset of integers. And next up we have three quarters is a rational number or three over four is an element of the rational numbers. And again, these are all true mathematical statements. Now for some false mathematical statements. There's still mathematical statements though, as long as you have a sentence which is definitely true or definitely false, it is a mathematical statement. So the first is, the square root of two is a rational number. So this is false. It's well known that the square root of two is irrational, and we'll prove that later in the course. Next is the set of all integers is a finite set. So the set of all integers is fairly clearly an infinite set. Next up, all triangles are right triangles. Well, I can think of a lot of triangles that are not right triangles. For example, equilateral triangles, those are not right triangles. And then next, every quadratic equation has two real solutions. So this is also false. You could have a quadratic equation with one real solution, a so-called repeated root, or you could have a quadratic equation with zero real solutions. For instance, x squared equals minus one. That doesn't have any real solution. And now I won't write these on the board, but some non-examples of mathematical sentences would be something like for all integers n. So that's just a phrase. That would be the setup for a mathematical statement. Or what is the solution to x squared plus three x equals one? But a question is neither true nor false until you start writing down the answer, but the answer would turn into a mathematical statement. Okay, so now I wanna go on to the standard strategy of naming mathematical statements. So now moving on, it's fairly typical to name mathematical statements. That sets up maybe a calculus of logic, which we'll see later. So general names occur like at the two thirds point of the alphabet, like P, Q, and R. Further, sometimes the these statements depend on variables. And in fact, if the truth of that statement depends on what the input of the variable is, it's technically not a statement anymore. It's something called an open sentence. And that's a bit more interesting when we have this variable dependence. So let's look at some examples. So let's say the statement, every differentiable function is continuous. We could call that statement P. So we've named that sentence. The next, if we said Q was the statement the function f of x equals sine x is unbounded, that would be the name for that sentence. We've named that q. Now I'd like to point out that p is most definitely true. Like in a calculus one class, you learn that if a function is differentiable, then it's continuous. q seems like it would be false because the function f of x is bound between negative one and one. And this is actually where context matters. So if x is a real number, then this is a false statement because sine of x, like I said, is bound between negative one and one. But if x is allowed to be a complex number, then this function is actually unbounded and this is true. So the truth of q depends on the context that we're working. And then here's another statement r, and that says if p and q are prime numbers that are two digits or more, so they are bigger than or equal to 11, then p to the fourth minus q to the fourth is a multiple of 240. This is a nice, fairly elementary number theory problem. So here are some open sentences. So they become statements when we plug in values for the variable. So here we have p of x, and the statement or the open sentence is x is an even integer. So notice we cannot determine the truth 
truth or the falseness of this open sentence without plugging in a number. So notice if we plug in the number like 2,142, then we get something which is most definitely true because 2,142 is even. But if we were to plug in something like 137, we would get a false statement because now the statement reads 137 is an even integer. Now, furthermore, if we were to plug in something like one half, we would also get a false statement because one half is not even an integer. Now let's look at another one. Let's say we have R of F, G. So in this case, it's depending on two variables and those variables are function. And this open sentence says the function F is the derivative of the function G. So the truth of this will be determined once we plug functions into this. And sometimes we'll have something that's true and sometimes we have something that's false. So let's notice if we plug in 2x plus 1 and x squared plus x, we get a true statement. That's because the derivative of x squared plus x is most definitely 2x plus 1. But if we plug in sine of x and cosine of x, we get a false statement. And that's because the derivative of cosine of x is in fact equal to negative sine of x. So we're almost there, but we're off by a sign. So now that we've got a pretty good idea of mathematical statements, open sentences, and the like, let's talk about how to combine two mathematical statements. Now we're gonna look at some operations that we can have on mathematical statements. So there are four main ones that we wanna start off with. The and statement, the or statement, the not statement, and the implication statement. So let's start off with and. So the notation is this wedge shape, and you read this as P and Q. And so in shorthand, you'd have this P wedge shape. Then we have this OR, which is maybe this upside down wedge shape or this V shape. And you read this as P OR Q. Then here we have this little squiggle. That's our NOT operator. So squiggle P will be the negation of the statement P. Now later we'll talk about how to negate complicated statements, but for now we're just going to be negating fairly simple statements. Then we've got our implication or our conditional. And so we read this as P implies Q or sometimes if P then Q. But in fact there's lots of other ways to write this down as well, which we'll see later in the video. Okay, so let's start with some fairly simple examples. So let's say we've got three statements. P is the statement three is odd. So notice this is is definitely a true statement. So I'll write a capital T for true. And then the second statement Q is 12 is odd. This is most definitely a false statement. So I'll write a capital F for false. And then finally, I've got a statement R, which is for all X, which are real numbers, the absolute value of the sine of X is less than one. Well, that's equivalent to saying that sine of X lies between negative one and one, as long as you have a real input. And from a trigonometry class, which you probably have in your past, that is a true statement. So now let's look at some combinations using these operators. So let's start by looking at P and Q. So we'll write this out in words. That says that three is odd and uh, 12 is odd. So we could maybe simplify that a little bit to three and 12 are both odd. That's maybe a more natural way to write this down. But notice this is most definitely a false statement because for this to be true, you would need both of these numbers to be odd, but only one of them is odd. So here we have a false statement. Great. And later we'll talk about how the truth or falsehood of a mathematical statement interacts with these operations. Now let's look at this, P or Q. So that would be three is odd or 12 is odd. Now we could maybe write this in a more natural way as well. And that more natural way might be something like this. Um, at least one of three or 12 is odd. So since three is odd, we're good to go because at least one of those two numbers is odd. So this is a true statement. Now let's maybe practice a negation. So maybe this is the simplest negation to practice and it's the most illuminating. So if we do not Q here, we would get the statement 12 is not 
odd. And since there's a word for not odd in this case, we probably wanna use that and that would be even. 12 is even. And that is a true statement. So as expected, if we negate a false statement, we get a true statement. And in fact, if we negate a true statement, we'll also get a false statement. Let's see that here. If we negate P, we'll get something like this. So we'll have three is not, but notice that's the same thing as saying that three is even. And like I said, that is a false statement. So the negation of a true statement is a false statement. Okay, let's look at one more real quick. Let's maybe look at P and R. So P and R would be the statement, three is odd and for all real numbers X, so X element of real numbers, the absolute value of sine X is less than or equal to one. So there's no natural way to combine these like we did before because they're two different types of sentences. One is about a number and one is about this function sine of x. So we would just leave the writing like this, but let's notice that this is a true statement. So it seems like when we connect a true statement and a true statement with an and statement, we get a true statement. All right, so that's good. So now I'm gonna introduce something called a truth table for making like quick calculations on these logical operations. So a truth table is like an operation table or maybe like a multiplication table for mathematical statements. But the multiplication depends on what operation we're interested in. Like it could be the and operation, the or operation, the not or operation, or as we'll see in just a bit, this implication or conditional operation. And so the idea here is we want to populate this left-hand side with all different possibilities of truth or falseness of Q and P interacting with each other, and then record the output of those operations on the right-hand side. So let's look at our AND table. So we need to look at the possibilities when P is true or false. So I'll have two trues for P and two falses for P. And then here I'll alternate the truth and the falsehood of Q. And now let's notice doing that strategy allows us to combine every possibility for P with every possibility for Q. Okay, and now let's be inspired by what we saw in the logic of the sentences, those concrete examples from the last board, to fill this in. So we have a true statement and a true statement must be a true statement. We have a true statement and a false statement must be a false statement. So the and operation requires both of the statements to be true. So that means a false statement and a true statement will give us a false statement and two false statements will give us a false statement. Now let's look at this other one, this or uh, operation. So we'll fill this in the same way. We have true, true, false, false, and then we have true, false, true, false. It's a little bit trickier when you have three inputs, but I'll let you think about a systematic way of covering all of those. So if you have two true statements and you combine them with an or, you get a true statement. So that would be something like two is either an even integer or it is an odd integer. Well, it's definitely one of those, so that is a true statement. Then a true statement and a false statement combined with an or to a true statement in both ways. Notice we've got some commutativity up of the operation here. And then two false statements will combine to give us a false. Now let's look at our not operation. Operation. So if we have a true statement, that will negate to a false statement and vice versa. If we have a false statement, that will negate to a true statement. Okay, so I think we're good to go with this. Now let's look at the implication or the conditional combination of two mathematical statements. So to look at conditional statements, I think our best starting strategy is to start with a statement which is a hidden conditional statement and break it down into two pieces. So our statement says, if the integer x is a multiple of 15, then x is a multiple of five. Let's notice that this is most definitely a true statement because every multiple of 15 is a multiple of three times five, but then it's obviously a multiple of five. So what we wanna do is break this off from the if and then, and then we'll have our two component statements. So let's say this is our first one, which I'll put in orange brackets. And then our second one I'll put in these purple brackets. So we'll define our orange bracketed thing to be P, and that will be the integer X is a multiple of 15. And then for the purple bracketed one, we'll define that to be our statement Q, and that'll be X is a multiple of... Okay, so now that we're done with this 
first example, let's look at another example that'll help us unravel like the truth table of our conditional statement. So our second example will help us build the truth table for this conditional. So let's say our statement P is the statement you pass the exam and the statement Q is the statement you pass the class. Then the implication P implies Q or if P then Q reads, if you pass the exam, then you pass the class. Okay, so let's maybe fill the truth table in by rewriting these two, by rewriting these possibilities as sentences over here and then getting an idea for whether or not the implication is good or not. So let's look at this first one. So P is true and Q is true. So this would be something like this. You pass the exam and the class. So does that violate this implication? Well, it does not violate this implication. You can think about this implication or this conditional as some sort of promise. And that promise is that Q will always be true as long as P is true. And that's exactly what we have here. So that means this implication here is true. Now let's look at the next one. So P is true and Q is false. And that will be, you pass the exam and fail the class. So notice that's a broken promise of the P implies Q statement. The P implies Q statement says that if you pass the exam, you're guaranteed to pass the class, but that does not occur in this scenario. So that tells us that this conditional would have been false. It's a broken promise. So we put a false right there. Now let's look at these others. So P is false and Q is false. So this would be you fail the exam and pass the class. Notice that doesn't break the promise here at all. That's okay. It might seem kind of strange Strange that false implies true should give you something true, but it does. So, and that's again, because this promise is not broken. Perhaps you did really well on all your homework or all of your other stuff. So you didn't really need to pass the exam to pass the class. Okay, so let's look at this last one. False implies false. So that would be you fail the exam and the class. And again, that does not break this promise either. So you would get a true statement here. So interestingly enough here, this P implies Q statement gives you true for three of the outputs and false for one of the outputs. And the false it gives you is based off this promise breaking. As long as P is true, then Q is also true. So lastly, I'd like to write down a several different wordings of this conditional statement. So there are tons of ways to write the conditional statement P implies Q. Here are a few. So the first is if P then Q. So the first is if P then Q. Then we could have Q if P, Q whenever P, Q provided P, whenever P then also Q, P is a sufficient condition for Q, Q is a necessary condition, condition for P, and P only if. Okay, so let's end with some warm-up problems. All right, here's a smattering of warm-up problems. So the first is to determine if the following are mathematical statements, and if they are mathematical statements, are they true? The first is the derivative of a cubic polynomial is a quadratic polynomial. Next is sets Q and R. Next is the union of R cross N with N cross R equals R cross R. Then next up, let's write the following in symbolic form, defining the component statements P, Q, R, so on and so forth if you need to. And then use our operations like P and Q, P or Q, not P, um, and the conditional P implies Q as needed. Okay, so first is there is a quiz on Monday or Wednesday. Next is X is in A minus B. So that's the set minus. The next is a geometric series converges only if its common ratio R satisfies the inequality the absolute value of R is less than one. And that's a good place to stop.